Hello and welcome to the PHS Flipped Classroom. Please be sure to work through the material presented in this video and complete the related exercises in your module prior to class. The major concepts will be reviewed in class, but you should be prepared to ask any questions about material that you might not understand. Now that we've learned about cells, including the structure and function of the nucleus, the plasma membrane, and the organelles found throughout the cytoplasm, we need to consider how these cells work together to perform different jobs in the human body. In Lesson 4, The Organization of Body Systems, we will learn the basics about tissues, membranes, and body cavities needed to talk about organ systems throughout the rest of the course. This lesson will give you a good foundation moving forward. You may find the textbook reading for this lesson to be somewhat challenging. Please be sure to focus on what page 16 of the module points out as being important. This includes the four types of tissues, the four types of membranes, body systems, and homeostasis. You should be able to list the types and provide examples of each. Again, you will need an understanding of these four concepts for the unit test and to move on to studying specific body systems. For the first few lessons, you learned about the general characteristics of an animal cell. In the first lab, you had the chance to view several different types of cells under a microscope and were able to observe that not all cells have the same structure. In this lesson, we will see how similar cells can be used as building blocks to form tissues and how different tissues can then work together to form organs and how several organs can come together to form organ systems such as the digestive system or the reproductive system. A number of organ systems then work together to form an organism, allowing that organism to perform the different bodily tasks needed to stay alive. It's important for all of these levels to be functioning properly for a person to be healthy. On a biological level, we usually talk about the cell as being the building block of life, but you are also taking chemistry this semester, so you already know that cells are actually composed of atoms and molecules. Atoms come together to form organic molecules, and all that means is that the majority of the molecule is made from carbon, which is the same for all organisms. The molecules are often linked together to form larger macromolecules, which is a term you'll become familiar with in Unit 1. Basically, these macromolecules can be thought of as a string of smaller molecules linked together. Examples include proteins and DNA. Finally, you are already familiar with cell theory, so you know that cells are the smallest unit of life and are used to build larger organisms. Well, how are cells actually used to build an organism? The body needs to be organized in order to perform different tasks. You don't find random cells scattered everywhere throughout the body. Instead, similar cells that have specialized functions, such as muscle cells or nerve cells, are typically found together so they can work together to complete a task. This material is called tissue. For example, muscle cells form muscle tissue and nerve cells or neurons form nervous tissue. The muscle tissue is then able to coordinate contractions to allow for movement and nervous tissue coordinates the transmission of information throughout the body. The next level of organization is an organ. Usually several different types of tissues need to come together to form an organ. For example, a heart is made up of a specialized muscle tissue called cardiac muscle, so it can contract during a heartbeat. But this organ is also made up of epithelial tissue, which covers and protects, and connective tissue, which binds and supports the heart. Basically, the tissues must perform as a team in order for an organ to function properly. To continue with the theme of teamwork, organs do not work in isolation. They typically work with other organs as part of an organ system. In these cases, the organs of the organ system are working together to perform a common function. For example, the heart and the blood vessels work together as part of the circulatory system. The esophagus, stomach, intestines, liver, pancreas, and rectum all work together as part of the digestive system. Each organ has a different role to play in the overall process, but the system as a whole must perform a task, such as pumping blood throughout the body in the case of the circulatory system, or breaking down and absorbing food in the case of the digestive system. Finally, all of these organ systems come together to form an organism. The levels of organization in the body explain how we can organize the cells in ways that allow important tasks to be completed. All right, so here's a recap. 
Everything in the human body is made up of atoms, which come together to form molecules. These molecules form more complicated structures, which are then used to create cells. In the case of this diagram, the cells are smooth muscle cells, which we will learn more about later in this lesson. These smooth muscle cells, all of similar structure and working towards a common goal, then come together to form smooth muscle tissue. Tissue is then used to create organs. In the case of this diagram, the example is a blood vessel made up of three types of tissue, connective tissue, smooth muscle tissue, and epithelial tissue. Finally, the blood vessels work as part of an organ system with other blood vessels in the heart to pump the blood throughout the body. Various organ systems, which we will list later in the lesson and throughout the course, function to allow this organism to live and participate in activities such as jogging. Just remember, we are moving from the smallest components into the organism as a whole. As discussed in class already, in preparation for the lab, form fits function. This is a common theme in biology, whether we are talking about organelles, a cell, or an organ in the body. How something is built is directly related to what it does. You can think about this as it relates to shoes. What is the structure of a high heel shoe versus flippers, versus work boots, versus ballet slippers? In each case, how does the structure of the shoe allow it to perform the function? Well, the high heels have material that holds a person's heel higher than the toe. That's the structure of the shoe. Overall, this makes a person taller and also holds the leg in an attractive shape. The flippers have a different shape altogether. They are much longer than the foot and they have a large flat surface area. This shape is the structure of the flipper. The shape allows it to perform its function which is to push water more effectively and move a person more quickly as he swims. Take a moment and think about the structure and function of the work boots and the ballet slippers. How are they shaped? What do they allow a person to do? Now that you've had the chance to think about form and function as it relates to shoes, let's think about how the same concept is related to cells in the body. Here are pictures of three of the four cells that you viewed under the microscope during the lab. As you probably remember, they look very different from one another. You can also see below each picture how the cells form tissue with other similar cells. Let's talk about form and function for each type of cell. First of all, what does muscle tissue do in the body? It contracts and allows movement to occur. What is it about the shape or structure of the muscle cell that allows the tissue to contract? Well, these muscle cells are sort of tapered near the end, which allows them to overlap. This will help the muscle shorten and lengthen when it is in use. You also might notice the lines throughout the cell. These lines are formed by proteins called actin and myosin, which are involved in the process of muscle contraction. What do you notice about the nerve cell? It has long extensions coming out of the cell body, which branch out and connect to other nerve cells. These connections allow the nerve cell to send information throughout the body. Finally, the skin cell in the picture looks a lot like the cheek cell in the lab, and in fact they belong to the same family of cells. The skin cells are flat and fit together well, like tiles, and can even overlap. Skin cells protect us, forming the outer layer of our body. The fact that they are flat and layered allows us to constantly lose skin cells and regenerate new ones without leaving our body exposed. The fourth type of cell viewed during the lab was the red blood cell. What does a red blood cell do in the body? How does its shape allow it to perform this function? The information on this slide should help you to answer the conclusion of the first lab. Now let's move on to talking a little more about tissues found in the human body. As a refresher, remember that tissue just means that we have a number of specialized cells that have come together to perform some sort of work. There are four types of tissues found in organisms, epithelial tissue, connective tissue, muscle tissue, and nervous tissue. There are different subsets of tissues found in each category, but generally speaking, the tissues within each category will be performing similar types of tasks. As you can see from this diagram, the different types of tissue look very different from one another. 
This makes sense because each tissue performs a different job in the body and, as we already know, form fits function. Just to give you an idea of where you would find some of these tissues, you can take a look at this diagram. One type of epithelial tissue is our skin. Skeletal muscle is found in our biceps. We have connective tissue running throughout our body. These cells actually look a lot like fat cells. Our brain is made up of nervous tissue. We also have two other types of muscle tissue. Cardiac muscle is a special muscle tissue found in our heart and smooth muscle, which we don't have control over, is found throughout our digestive tract, including our intestines. Let's talk a little more about these four different types of tissue found in our body, learning more about the function of each. The primary function of epithelial tissue is to cover and protect. The most obvious example is the skin covering the outer part of our body, but the inner parts of our body, such as body cavities and the insides of different organs, also need to be protected. Different types of epithelial tissue are found in these places. For example, your skin looks and feels different than your inner cheek, but they both cover and protect. Glands in your body are also made up of epithelial tissue. We'll talk a little bit more about this on the next slide. Another function of epithelial tissue is that they can secrete, absorb, or filter substances. For example, sweat glands produce and release sweat to help us regulate our body temperature when we're too hot. You can find epithelial tissue lining surfaces both inside and outside the body. This includes the lining of the chambers of the heart, as well as the inside of the digestive and respiratory tracts. The major role of glands in the body is to secrete a product. Secrete is just a scientific word for produce and release into the body. Depending on the type and location, glands might produce a hormone, enzyme, or mucus. There are three types of glands that we'll come across in this course. First, there are one-celled glands. As you can probably guess, these are simple structures that are literally only one cell. An example of a one-celled gland would be the cells that produce mucus along the digestive and respiratory systems. The second type of gland is called an exocrine gland. These glands secrete their product through a duct or a small tube, which then directs the product to a specific place where it will do its job. We'll see this occur in the digestive system later in this unit. The third type of gland is called an endocrine gland. These glands secrete their product directly into the bloodstream, which then carries it throughout the body. Let's take a quick look ahead to the final few lessons of this unit and relate the information that we just learned about glands to the pancreas. The pancreas is a necessary organ in the process of digestion and also in regulating blood sugar levels in the body. As a gland, the pancreas actually works as both an endocrine gland and an exocrine gland. Most of you are probably aware that the pancreas produces insulin in our body, the hormone responsible for signaling that cells should take up glucose, which we know from previous lessons is needed to produce ATP in the cells. When the pancreas produces insulin, it performs as an endocrine gland, releasing the insulin directly into the bloodstream. The second function of the pancreas is one that we're going to learn more about this unit, which is the production of digestive enzymes. When the pancreas produces digestive enzymes, it performs as an exocrine gland, releasing the digestive enzymes into a duct or a small tube that leads into the small intestine. These enzymes will then work on breaking down nutrients that we have taken into our body in the form of food.